All right, so um, welcome to the T-Space Architecture Lecture Series. This is the first in a series of eight lectures organized by T-Space. It's within the framework of the Architecture Residency Program. And I will just take a couple of moments to introduce everyone while our audience is uh, still joining. So I'm Irini Tsakhrelia. I am a practicing architect and an educator in New York. I've been involved with T-Space uh, as an instructor for the architecture residency program since the beginning of the program in 2017. And uh, since the last year, I've joined T-Space as the director of the educational programming in addition to instructing our residents. Our co-host for this event uh, is Maxwell Funk. Hi, Max. Max is an architect as well. He's a residency host and the administrator for the program. For our new audience, very briefly, T-Space is a non-profit organization and it is an initiative of the Stephen Myron Hall Foundation, which focuses on the arts, education, design, and ecology. T-Space programming supports really the coming together of the arts, architecture, art, music, and poetry. And in addition to the architecture residency program, which takes place once a year, T-Space produces the synthesis of arts events, which involve art exhibitions, poetry readings, music performances, and those take place usually on the grounds in Rhinebeck uh, every summer. One such event is coming up already next Saturday on July 17th. It's called the Raptures and Reconciliations by Anthony Titus with music by Anthony Braxton and poetry by Kathy Park Hong. So please feel free to register for this event and also check out any other upcoming events and lectures by T-Space. Look out for those links that are coming in in the chat. Uh, so this is where you can find further information about those events. All our events are taking place virtually this year, same as last year. And we're certainly looking forward to welcoming everybody back at T-Space when we're open during next summer. So the lecture that you joined today by Kostis Kurelis is the part of the architecture residency program, uh, which as I mentioned, takes place once a year. It's a 25 intensive. And it started just earlier this week, two days ago. Our residents are here on the panel. They're joining from different parts of the world. I just want to say hello to everyone. Reggie Mays, Alexander Kern, Megan Pisarczyk, and Brian Hartman, Jack Wathew, and Yolanda Wen. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Hello. Hello. We are very, very pleased this year that our residents have received the support um, with scholarships that were generously provided by Steve Pulimo, Steve uh, Silman Engineers, the Al Held Foundation, and the Art of Building in Rhinebeck. We're very, very happy for the support, and we certainly welcome your support as well in making this programming possible and available and accessible to all. The residency program invites young professionals and students uh, from the field of art and architecture to experiment with design and focus on critical thinking. And the theme for the residency this year is called Transformation Consciousness. It follows along the theme of last year um, and um, we'll see what uh, interesting thought experiments our residents are coming up with uh, during the for the duration of the residency. Now to our main guest uh, for today, Kostis Kurelis. It's very great to have you here, Kostis, joining us from Philadelphia. Kostis is an architectural historian and an archaeologist, and he is an associate professor of art history at Franklin Marshall College. His work focuses on settlements, landscapes, and vernacular architecture, and he investigates the intersection between archaeological practices and artistic avant-garde in the early 20th century. He's the author of the book Punk Archaeology, among many other books, and it's really great uh, to have you here and excited to hear your lecture which is titled Radical Byzantium Art, Archaeology and Humanitarianism in 1920s Greece. Very, very briefly, Kostis, uh, I will pass on the microphone to you. Uh, I just wanted to mention to our audience, um, the lecture is approximately 40 
minutes long, uh, and it will be followed by a Q&A, approximately 15 minutes. Our panelists are welcome to start the Q&A, and then we will open up to the broader audience. Feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen throughout the duration of the, rest, the lecture. You don't need to wait until the, the end. So with that, I welcome everybody, and uh, thank you, Kostis. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. This is a really great, uh, great honor to be to be part of a uh, of a workshop, really, of the studio. Um, I'm I'm a historian, so I'm usually uh, I, I tend to speak to uh, you know historians more than practitioners. So um, I've I've put together uh, a a consolidation of a number of ideas that I've uh, that I've that I've been working on. So one of the things that I wanted to put out there for you on the chat box is my. Um, uh, is a place where you can sort of download anything that you might want from from some of this published work, and I just want to highlight three um, uh, three essays that I'll be that, that have sort of you know brought together. Um, one is called Byzantium and the Avant Garde: Excavations at Corinth, 1920s to 1930s. Uh, Byzantine Houses and Modern Fictions: Domesticating um, Mistras in 1930s Greece, and Flights of Archaeology: Peshkes Acre Corinth, and you know. I, I, you, you will, you know, if you have any more interest in this topic, you'll find the, some of the detailed documentation. Um, the next thing I'd like to do very, very briefly is to show you, let me share my screen. Oh, hold on just a second. Uh, am I able to? Uh, you guys can see this, right? Um, so yes, so this is the, um, uh, the the place where you can download some of the articles. Uh, I just want to very briefly give you a little uh, uh, introduction of the places that I will be talking to. I'll, talk, I'll be talking about. So uh, it's very far from the Hudson Valley, but uh, I'll be talking about this region of the world that's uh, situated between uh, Constantinople, Istanbul, which was the capital of the Byzantine Empire, and Rome, which was the capital of the Roman Empire, and, the, and both of them inherited the classical world. And I will be referring to a series of, um, uh, of archaeological sites and projects, um, mostly in the uh, site of ancient Corinth, which is located here, a little bit west of Athens. Um, at the beginning, I'll make some quick references to Delphi and the uh, a lesser known area called Livoriki, and then um, quick reference to a refugee settlement in Nea Chios, and a quick reference to Thessaloniki. So anyway, have a, have a, um, a look at that. So let me start. The, I will also take a little bit of a, of a digression to tell you about the kind of research that I do as an archaeologist or as an architectural historian. The, the, my, my field of expertise is what might be called uh, uh, ephemeral architecture, uh, settlements, uh, how humans have been uh, dealing with crises and how architectural design has uh, at, solved them in an ad hoc um, kind of uh, response. So many of those projects that I work on are not designed by architects. I'll show you some glimpses of, the, of some recent contemporary projects that have to do with refugee housing, workers housing, and they deal with the contemporary world rather than the world of the hundred years ago. So I've uh, been involved in the project of mapping of the 50 or so camps that the Greek government has placed throughout the countryside studying the architecture of tents and temporary housing. Here, example of one of those projects. And then coordinating with the long history of Greece's refugee history that goes back already in the Greek War of Independence in 1821, but more recently in 1923. And you see here refugees from Asia Minor. This is, more, this is a family from the 1.2 million refugees that, um, that are the result of very, very tumultuous Balkan Wars and World War I. And this is the kind of refugee crisis that the architects that I will be talking about are, um, are referring to. This really quick drawing shows you the coexistence between a Syrian camp today, which you see here, just a very, very quick drawing, and Mandra, which is the a site from the 1920s. So for 2020, 1920, you have this really bizarre relationship of, uh, of refugee housing. Here's the 1920s uh, refugee settlement. You can see it's surviving uh, the, the, the pattern of these square houses. Um, this is what they look like. They are very small. They're very interesting from a typological point of view. Um, I also do research on the, archi the architecture of immigration, not from um, not into Greece, but also out of Greece, uh, working on a project of uh, ethnic neighborhoods. Uh, I'll show you, for example, a, a photograph from uh, the tenements of uh, Greek migrants into the United States in Chicago from 1910. 
My research also sometimes takes me to places of trauma. Uh, a most recent project uh, through the National Park Service is at the Japanese internment camp um, of Minidoka. As many of you may know, Japanese Americans were incarcerated after World War I, after Pearl Harbor. And here we're working with the, uh, uh, with, with the Park Service in understanding the architecture of these barracks, which very interestingly, right after the, the war, were um, uh, broken up into sections and sold for a dollar to returning veterans that were coming to the, um, uh, to the sort of uh, high desert of, uh, of, of Idaho. Another project deals in a similar vein on the architecture of um, uh, not so much trauma, but of economic opportunity. This is a project in the fracking oil fields of North Dakota. We're documenting the emergence of these RV camps of the many, many, many workers that fled their, um, their homes throughout the United States to take, to take advantage of the, uh, of the oil boom. Uh, and here you see the famous man camps. Um, and, um, once again, it's the presence of architecture, it's the study of settlements, it's the study of ephemeral architectural solutions that are done really without architects. I'll show you, for example, one of these RV North Dakota camps and you see the kind of ingenuity of, of taking an RV. I mean, as you probably all know, RVs are designed to function on, uh, for, to be lived in for three weeks in the month of May to June, they're really recreational. Uh, but here in the context of the, of the cold, uh, uh, steps of North Dakota, they're used as permanent housing and you see the addition of various rooms, the introduction of, ser of uh, certain kind of uh, elements of, of domesticity, um, uh, um, turning a temporary settlement into a permanent house. And here you see sort of some attempt to archeologically document what is the material uh, vestments of that kind of existence. Greece now is the place of intense crisis. Um, I bring this up having, based on a conversation earlier with Irini. Uh, this is from Time Magazine from uh, the 1940s, uh, recording the destruction of the massacre, really the genocide in some way of Greek village um, during the German occupation of World War II. So one of our projects um, is to really go into one of these uh, massacred villages um, uh, in, uh, in in the area of Litoriki and try to understand what it means for to have sort of you know human caused destruction. The, the residents of this village were taken all into a concentration camp. Um, uh, lucky for them, the war ended about nine months after they were uh, their village was destroyed and they actually returned back to the village. So we're trying to archeologically understand what does it mean to live in the ruins of a house that has been um, uh, ruined by war. And let's not forget that one in every five, uh, sometimes one every four or five villages, traditional vernacular, beautiful villages in Greece were in fact burned during the German occupation. So you see it's trying to understand the death of a building, the death of a body and it's kind of resuscitation through, um, through occupation and also trying to understand the, the material culture that uh, incorporated it. Sometimes elements, as you see here, like a, a Singer sewing machine or a Victrola that were in fact sent from the immigrants in the United States back to the Greek countryside and then ultimately uh, destroyed during, um, during the burning of this village. And just if you indulge me for one second, um, you can, uh, our objective here is kind of forensic. We are, are indeed architects, but in some way, we're more interested in uh, recreating or the uh, archeological forensic um, record of a, um, um, uh, of a phenomenon, of, of an event. Um, let me just show you very quickly this we uh, this uh, 3D uh, through drone photography documentation of one of these uh, ruined houses from the village of Lidariki so that then we can take this drawing is not to create another village or to design anything new but to really to, really to understand what falls first is it the wood is it the ceramics is it the is it the is it the stone and what happens uh, once you have an element of um, of, of entropy and human destruction. Okay, let's, let's move on. Okay, now it's important for me to give you this little introduction because what I'll talk about is how archeologists like me or architectural historians like me had a similar approach in trying to understand the, contem the contemporary world of crisis around them. Give me one second, there is a, some tree yeah. cutting outside, so I'll close my window. Mm -hmm. It's the, the um, tree and the fan is further away, right, Costis? I turned the fan off, so I hope you can. Oh, it's like, good, good, good. So, so it should you. be okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about contemporary archaeology, contemporary housing, um, uh, but I will talk a little bit about the uh, 
the intersection between history and architecture in the war-ridden country of Greece uh, during the 1920s, about 100 years ago, um, as perhaps as a model of how we can, we can engage with contemporary society and how we can try to understand the archaeological dimensions of our lived, of our, of our lived world. Okay, so I'm going to talk really about Byzantium. I don't expect you guys to know what Byzantine period or Byzantium is, but I use it in some way as a, the historical uh, Byzantium is a historical civilization that precedes the classical. In fact, you may want to see my talk as a kind of a conflict between the classical, between the Parthenon, um, all the work of the Renaissance, uh, Roman architecture that is built on the ideal of perfection, the ideal of mathematical and visual um, 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 uh, perfection that uh, needs to be uh, modeled or duplicated in order to, um, to, you know, to retain some of its visual elements. The classical world fell, like Rome fell in the fifth century and it was preceded by the Byzantine empire which moved the capital into Constantinople. So when we think of Byzantium, we think of not the Parthenon, but the Hagia Sophia, uh, the, um, you know, the great church in Istanbul, Constantinople, which in some way took the inheritance of Greece and Rome, but did something entirely different with it. If we go to Greece, uh, I show you a little church in Athens called the Little Metropolis. We see that in some way there is continuity between the classical and the Byzantine, but there are some fundamental differences in the uh, aesthetics of dealing with time and the aesthetics of dealing with the past. So this little metropolis, as you can see, is made up by reused fragments from other classical temples. It has a geometrical regularity, it has a geometrical beauty to it, but in addition to its, um, um, you know, to its clarity, it also contains a statement about this particular moment in time, the 12th century relationship to the past that it inherits. Perhaps another way to think of it, and I try to think of a way to make this really relevant to you guys, is to think of this polarity between, let's say, Montgomery Place as the classical idea, this perfect visually consumed um, um, articulation of uh, classical languages, geometries, proportions, experiences, and Olana, uh, which I think is one of the sites that you guys visited on the Hudson River Valley, totally irregular, a hodgepodge of styles, multiple colors, uh, and very much inspired um, by the Byzantine period. So I'm setting this up as a, as a foil, as a kind of artificial foil, because I want you to think about how, how Byzantium, which is the, uh, the, 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 the unclassical, as, as I've been sort of articulated in the 19th and 20th century, requires a different approach towards design and a different approach towards representing space and the past. Okay. So in January 1951, the architect Louis Kahn traveled to Greece and made an explicit pilgrimage to Corinth. Here we see him in Delphi, where Irene is, sitting at one of the hotels, looking over. He's the man, he's the man with the pipe. But he spent an entire day in front of the temple. Of, or I should say that the reason why us uh, Americans, architectural students, go to Greece, go to Europe, is in order to right, access the authentic remnants of the past in the model of the Col de Beaux-Arts as this was developed in the 19th century, right? So basically Delphi is a French excavation connected to the Col de Beaux-Arts. The idea here, you as an architect have to go to Greece, have to excavate Delphi in order that you are able then to take the lessons of that classical perfection and just copy it into Montgomery Place, just copy it into the Lincoln Memorial. Um, in some way, Louis Kahn, who was educated in the Beaux-Arts School of the University of Pennsylvania, like went to Delphi with that heritage in mind. But he, when he went to Corinth, the ancient site of Corinth, uh, he sat in front of this temple of Apollo, right? This little Parthenon, a little older than the Parthenon from the archaic period. And he produced three drawings. Um, and of course, this is very relevant in the work of, um, you know, Stephen Hall in thinking about the watercolor as a way of understanding the, the environment in the past. So he sat there on, 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 a, on a cold winter day for, the, for an entire 10 hours and drew the temple 
in three, seven actually different, uh, different drawings of which I show you three. Now, concluding with perhaps the most well-known one of these, of these drawings. So you must admit that the colors, the intensity, the approach of this drawing is very different from the classical idea of the Col de Beaux-Arts. Why did Louis Kahn go to Corinth? The ancient site of Corinth had been excavated by American archeologists since 1896. I will make the argument that Louis Kahn went to Corinth because Corinth was a laboratory of experimentation. He knew Corinth from his teacher, Lester Holland, who taught him drawing at the University of Pennsylvania in the 1920s. Every foreign nation, like we said, France had the excavation of Delphi, right? Every foreign nation in Greece was given one particular site in which they could bring their architects, their students, their, their scholars. So Corinth was the place for Americans. You see those architects, those archeologists, really measuring every block of the Temple of Apollo. Now, Lester, as Americans are excavating Corinth, they're realizing that they need staff, they need architectural fellows, they need a T-square program, an annual internship program to bring those architectural students or recent graduates in order for them to execute the drawings that are necessary to understand those excavations. So one of them is Lester Holland, um, who not only was Louis Kahn's teacher back at Penn in the 1920s, but during the Great Depression, he, uh, taking his experiences from Corinth, he created a program for unemployed architects called the Historical American Building Survey, HABS. So unemployed American architects went around recording America's heritage as if it were the classical heritage, Colonial Williamsburg, right? All those great places where Washington slept. So you may have heard of his name, not as, not as, a, um, uh, as, as a great thinker and, and, and teacher of architectural drawing, but more as the Lester Holland Prize. This is an annual prize that the, that the Park Service, the Historical American Engineering Recording Historical American Building Survey gives to a student every year and sends them to any part of the United States to execute those very, very careful drawings. The second person that I wanna talk about, which that I'll introduce you to is someone named Richard Stilwell, who was a fellow similarly like Holland, an architecture fellow in Corinth between 1904 and 1926. He's really important and completely unknown because returning back to the United States, he ended up becoming a professor of, of classical archeology span at Princeton and became a mentor of Robert Venturi uh, when Robert Venturi was an undergraduate at Princeton University. So here's a list of all the architecture fellows between 1903 and 1933 that spent at least a year uh, going native in some way in Greece, understanding the contemporary crisis of Greece, but more importantly, using Corinth as a laboratory of both excavation, but also design and reinvention. Some of these students like William Densmore, William Bell Densmore took that knowledge and did the generic thing, the generic, generic thing, right? Basically design a copy of the Parthenon for uh, Nashville, Tennessee. If any of you have been to the uh, three quarter scale concrete Parthenon, it's one of the Corinth fellows that created it. Another fellow, Julian Whitlesey, um, uh, in the 1940s had a really successful practice in, of, of modernism in, in New York City. And he ended up in 1952 designing with Noguchi uh, the playground for the United Nations. Now I'm not arguing that each one of these 12 architects have some debt to the ancient sign of Corinth. But I do wanna argue that that experience of, of one year, a residency in Corinth created a different kind of sensibility and a different kind of ar uh, architectural culture than, um, um, the, uh, than, uh, the, that we have now almost sort of forgotten about um, 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 and need to kind of rediscover. Okay, so this is the context. A bunch of architects going to Greece, using it as a laboratory, and using it not as a place where they go and distantly look at from, you know, as, a, as an object of, of, um, of worship from the distance, but as literally getting their hands dirty uh, in, in, the, in the trenches. Why did they go to Greece? Many of you know, let's, let's review the Bozar history. In 1893 at the World's Columbia Exposition in Chicago, the white city established classical architecture as the new model through which every American city needs to be designed. So the city beautiful movement, right, created a need, an architectural need to send American architects to the Col de Beaux-Arts, to Rome, 
so that they could learn how to do these Roman buildings. They established a school, the American Academy in Rome, which you probably have heard of, right, which was designed by McKee, Mead, and White. In fact, the Gorham Stevens, the first fellow in Corinth, was an employee at McKean's office in New York, and he was sent to Rome in order to oversee the construction of the American Academy Villa in 1913, and then ultimately became its first director. At that point, the American Academy in Rome joined with the American School of Classical Studies in Rome. So archaeologists and architects for the first time occupied the same halls and um, had, um, you know, uh, uh, had conversations with each other. It wasn't always very, um, uh, very joyful. Uh, one of the things that is really kind of interesting is that the, the archaeology profession was a lot more, um, uh, had involved a lot more women at the time. There, were, there was a lot more female archaeologists uh, where architecture was entirely male. So there's a kind of um, um, uh, a little bit of a kind of a, an, an anti-feminist approach between the architects and the, and the classical archaeologists. Uh, but that's probably a topic for another day. I'll show you what the students did when they went to the T-square in Rome, which is basically to, um, uh, you know, take, take an ancient monument. I'm showing you now the, draw the competition drawing from, um, by William Huff, a Quaker from Philadelphia who studied with Paul Cray uh, as, as um, um, you know, as Louis Kahn did. This drawing won him the prize to go to Rome, where he ended up spending his entire year uh, drawing the uh, the, the, the mission's palace, and you can see him drawing with all the sort of ancient objects. Uh, now, what's interesting is that in 1917, Greece was not accessible. He writes back to his mother, Greece is blockaded by the allies, right? World War I, and at present, no one can enter. I wonder if I'll ever get to go to this blessed place. I'm still taking lessons in modern Greek from Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens is the wife of Gorham Stevens. She's actually Greek. She's, uh, when Gorham Stevens was a fellow in Athens, he fell in love with a Greek woman, Mrs. Not Miss Notaha, and they became married. Um, and he goes on to say about the impossibility of actually reaching Greece. Why would a fellow of the American Academy in Rome go to Greece? There was not equivalent American Academy in, in, in Athens. And what we've learned is that the trip to Greece was actually an optional thing that you would do in the spring semester of your second year. So the trip to Greece was not scripted. The trip to Greece for the, um, for the Rome fellows um, was something that was done entirely as, uh, on, their, on their own will, if they were able to get there. Okay, so let's go to Greece. So I think I've given you a bit of an introduction of the culture of the 19 teens, 1920s, that gave the motivation and the financial incentive for American architecture students to go to the Mediterranean so that they could copy damn classical buildings. Once they arrive in Corinth, famous ancient city, right? Chock full of temples, right? What they encounter is a much richer archeological past. In fact, if you look at the ancient site of Corinth, the only thing that's actually ancient that's standing is the Temple of Apollo. Everything else is completely submerged. Now, the American archeologists in Corinth who were inviting these architects to come and work with them and play with them and understand the site with them, they were very concerned about this area right here. I, know, I don't know if you can see my, um, my pointer. So between the Temple of Apollo that you see here, as, as Louis Kahn, remember, uh, uh, drew, and this long stoa building, this long Hellenistic uh, stoa building, there was the Roman Forum, okay, the Roman, um, the Roman, um, you know, piazza, right? But there was no sense of where the Greek agora was, so there was this great need to excavate this Roman Forum in order to get back to the good classical stuff. While I have this on this map um, uh, visible to you, I will also pinpoint number 23, which is in fact a museum designed by one of the architects. And this is for one of the reasons why this, you know, I chose to kind of talk to you a little bit more about this. And then at number 13, you have something called Pyrene Spring. This is a, a spring house. And right next to it, you have a, um, 
what what I will what I will describe as uh, as a folly, which is actually a museum of Byzantine architecture, which opened its doors but never survived the Second World War. So these American architects dig for the forum to find the good stuff of antiquity, right? They get they're good classicists, and this is what they find. They find all these medieval houses. This is Carpenter's Folly. This is a museum that I will return to that was designed by one of these architectural fellows in order to house what they're finding unexpectedly here, which is this later period. This is also the time that archaeology becomes more of a scientific discipline. Forget about Indiana Jones. Like up until 1921, you could be Indiana Jones. You could just go and like loot things and just go and like dig through stuff and just go get treasures that you can then sell to the Metropolitan Museum or to the Louvre. In 1921, archaeologists develop a scientific method of looking at stratigraphy. Here's a drawing by, um, you know, sort of, sort of an instructional drawing from 1921 by Mortimer Willer, who invented the method of scientific stratigraphic excavation. And the idea is very simple, right? You have to very carefully remove each layer, starting from the latest one to the earliest one. So you dig through and you draw these stratigraphic sections so that you know which are all the civilizations that have passed. The understanding is also that if you excavate one of these layers, you're destroying it. It's unrecoverable. So stratigraphy gets invented, they discover medieval houses and they can't just bulldoze through it because they want to do the ethical thing, which is to actually understand it as a settlement, as a vernacular, example of post-classical Byzantine occupation. And you see here the medieval walls. These are very small rooms, very interesting architectural kind of units. I won't get into the, in, into the details. So these architects are then asked to, as the excavators are going down, to create, you know, in the field to create these measured plans for these houses. Like they're basically these random walls that slowly and steadily create architectural spaces that were once occupied in the Byzantine period. The war interferes in 1940 and the results of this excavation are never published and many of these architects then become forgotten. But a professor from, you know, Robert Scranton, an architectural historian from Vassar College returns to Greece right at the same time that Louis Kahn visits and recovers all that data and publishes this very important volume called the Medieval Architecture. So you see, here's the stoa from the Roman period. Everything in black, everything in dark is ancient. Everything else is medieval, right? So you see, you have this discovery of Byzantium. Along comes the excavation of some really important ceramics. Here is a Byzantine plate. Now, if I gave this to you at the beginning of class, uh, sorry, the beginning of the lecture, at the, uh, as you saw it in the, uh, in the announcement, you would think that this is quite modern. Um, it really depicts uh, a couple, right? Uh, like a, a male and a female, he sits on her lap. There's images of rabbits and a hare. Many have interpreted this as a kind of a sexual imagery, perhaps a wedding plate, something celebrating sexual activity. When we think of Byzantium in the middle ages, you don't think of sex, right? You think of church and monks and prayer and incense. But you must admit, if you discover this in the 1920s, the first thing that would come to mind is modern art. So there's something extremely modern about the Byzantine artifacts that these architects are discovering. So they're beginning to publish it. Corinth 9, the first publication of Byzantine pottery. I should tell you that before the times of these Corinth architects and archeologists, people would think that this is just bad art, right? They would look at this and say, oh my God, this person is not educated. He's not like the attic black vase painting that we're used to. This is a kid's drawing, right? This is degenerate. This is something we need to um, you know, move through. But this generation says, no, this is actually, in fact, in some way, a lot more interesting because of its, because, because of its, um, uh, of, of its visual style. It's this generation then that begins to then reappreciate the Byzantine style of mosaics. So they send an expedition. Uh, a couple of Bryn Mawr College professors go out and photograph all the mosaics of uh, these two important monasteries, Daphne and Hosius Lucas. If you've taken the history of serve, the survey of Western art, I'm sure you've seen this image of the Pantocrator, which becomes the iconic image of, um, uh, of, of Byzantine mosaics. It's also interesting that this is the first publication of uh, color photography. 
which of course is extremely important in the non-white art of the classical period, because Byzantium is color, it requires different uh, 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 documentation. So in the midst of all this excitement of discovering this, this, uh, this ad hoc civilization, the, um, uh, they decide to actually rebuild one of these houses, kind of re reconstruct it in some way, and incorporate in its walls some of the fragments that they've been excavating. And this becomes, the, the, this becomes planned as a, a new Byzantine museum that will have both antiquities in the marble decoration in it, but would also have some of these marble antiquities involved in, in, in its masonry, in its wall. The, uh, unfortunately, the war starts. It's ready to open, but World War II starts. Italy invades Greece, not, Germany invades Greece, and by between 1940 and 1944, Greece is like what we might, what we imagine Syria to be like today. The Corinthians are so impoverished, they have such little resources that in fact, they take the wood from the roof and they use it to warm themselves in the winter, right? So the roof gets, gets used by the locals and uh, the, whole, um, uh, the whole project is, um, uh, is abandoned. Now, what I'd like to do for, oh my gosh, let me look at the time, it's 11.38. So what I'd like to do is try to contextualize some of the excitement of these new aesthetics some of the excitement of discovering Byzantium and using it as a radical critique of the neoclassicism of the American educational system, okay? So let me give you a little bit of the context. I'll try to move this through. Um, okay, so, so we should remember that until the late 19th century, a predominantly Protestant America had little interest in the, stu in the study of the Middle Ages of the kind of Catholic or Papist medieval Europe. Uh, Charles Eliot Norton, who is uh, the founder of the first art department in America at Harvard University in the 19th century, he appropriated an arts and crafts educational model and he propagated an interest in the artistic universe of the Middle Ages, right? John Ruskin, uh, you may have heard of the important uh, intellectual who wrote, who wrote the Stones of Venice in 1815, was a good friend of his and they, and, and, and they corresponded. So the first art school in the United States, not the first architecture school, mind you, right? The first art school in the United States, the first art history department is modeled under the aesthetics of, um, uh, of John Ruskin, who discovered Byzantium in the monuments of Venice and became supremely influential in the education of young American intellectuals. As was the case at Oxford and Cambridge, Anglo-Catholicism gained popularity among the estates of the Ivy League by offering an avenue of rebellion from America's Puritan or Quaker ancestry. This transgressive affection to Catholicism and Byzantium brought about a wave of religious conversion. Most famously, T.S. Eliot, who kind of converted to Catholicism, and even a revival of medieval crafts. What I show you very quickly is, the, is, is two illustrations, two original watercolors from John Ruskin from 1851 that uh, from Venice, right? That show the anti-classical. The drawings themself, themselves highlight the multiple periods of time that remain on a monument, the imperfection of history, the hodgepodge. I mean, you know, the, the medieval architecture in Venice is like totally insane. You have a Gothic element and you have Islamic element and it is totally, I mean, we might, today we might say totally postmodern, right? But it is not coherent. It's not considered to be beautiful. So Ruskin is involved in, the, um, in, 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 the, in a new aestheticism that is hinged entirely on Byzantium. Okay, so Byzantium becomes the fighting period for modernism. We can see that, for example, in the, um, in the revival of medieval crafts, such as Henry Chapman Mercer's Moravian tiles, uh, uh, in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, who he was a Harvard esthete of the 19 teens, um, who effectively replicated Oscar Wilde's Oxford of the 1890s. One of those collegiate aestheticists is, uh, is Susan Glaspell and George Cram Cook. George Cram Cook is best known for founding the Provincetown Players, probably the first radical theater group in America, what, Eugene O'Neill being its most important members. So in 1922, uh, George Cook and Susan Glaspell decided to leave New York. They felt that Eugene O'Neill had turned the Provincetown players into, it was too corporate. So they had to leave Manhattan. They, they located to Delphi where they literally went native. Here is, you know, Cook dressed up as a Greek shepherd. 
Um, unfortunately, he, he was his nice puppy. Unfortunately, he was bitten by this dog and ended up dying prematurely. But his objective was to revive some kind of immersive experience in the ancient site of Delphi, not to copy it for its beautiful Ionic and, and Corinthian ornament, but to actually to immerse oneself in the theatrical world and experience. Isadora Duncan follows, follows her mentor and comes to Greece. Uh, many of you may know her as the very important pioneer in dance. And um, she founds a lesser known uh, project, which is the Byzantine Choir, with whom she goes on tour in Germany in 1904. And with her comes Raymond, actually, by the way, is it, uh, Isidore Duncan, born in San Francisco, right, total American, um, uh, probably the first, um, the first person to become, to have like, to be an influencer. She wore uh, handmade uh, sheets. Uh, she refused to buy clothes that were made by, um, by sweatshops or by any kind of industrial um, uh, production. So she wore these ancient looking robes that she paraded around. Photographers followed her. She was an incredible celebrity. So she comes to Greece, 19, uh, here you see her with um, uh, reviving Byzantine chant. More importantly than her, she loses interest in Byzantium and moves on and does something else, right? But her brother, Raymond Duncan, stays in Greece and continues this project of, uh, of um, an avant-garde immersion into the life of Greece, into the post-classical life of Greece. So the Duncans, in fact, buy a piece of property in the middle of Athens. This is what it looked like. Here you see, you can, you can pull them out, right? They're all wearing um, non-commercially produced uh, white sheets, right? Uh, they create a new house, which, at, which actually survives today and is completely incorporated into the fabric of Athens, which becomes perhaps the first like arts and crafts tea space. It, becomes, it really becomes the first experimental house of Americans, but not in the States, in Greece. And you see here, they're discovering ancient crafts, the revival of crafts, this new Byzantium that becomes an opportunity to break down norms about, um, um, you know, heteronormativeness, uh, gender roles, expectations about um, men and women. Not only that, immersed in the greatest humanitarian crisis of World War I, Raymond, who by the way, I'll tell, tell you about who he soon married, who he marries as a partner, a Greek woman from Greece, they go into the refugee camps of Northern Greece in 1913 and they teach everyone self-sustenance. They teach them how to create their own clothes and not be dependent on any kind of sort of foreign aid. Um, and here you see them beginning a kind of artistic practice that involves um, you taking your arts, your crafts into communities of need. So Duncan marries Penelope Sikelianos, who is the sister of Greece's most important um, poet. And she herself uh, becomes sort of a teacher of textiles. Unfortunately, up in the refugee camps of Epirus, she con contracts tuberculosis and dies soon thereafter. Um, now, Angelos, right, her brother, you see, Angelos Kionios, the famous poet, falls in love with another American woman named Eva Palmer, recent graduate from Bryn Mawr College, who gets the idea to come to Greece as well and revive the immersive experience of craft and art by holding the first Coachola Festival, the first art festival in the world, the Delphic Festival of 1927. And you see it so, so well known, it was covered by National Geographic. And you see once again these these, these uh, esthetes, these um, uh, you know um, uh, intellectuals using Delphi, using uh, the sites of Greece as a way to reinvigorate modernist culture. Let's go very quickly to architectural taste. How is Byzantium uh, incorporated, not by artists and avant-garde intellectuals, but by architects? Uh, let me let me fast forward. Now the Byzantine Romanesque style indistinguishable at first, had entered American church design in order to distinguish low church Episcopalians from the high church brethren. You might remember H.H. H. Richardson, his 1877 Trinity Church in Boston, and other such commissions like the Richardsonian revival, which is another incorporation of the hodgepodge of Venice, right? Another, another Ruskinian new aesthetics that defies classical antiquity. In fact, look at him, Richardson is dressed like a medieval monk this is at work, right? With a bottle of beer, with a, you know, with a, with a, this is the model, not the Beaux-Arts 
industrial studio where you have all your desks and you have all your employees and your students that go to Rome and they create these slavish copies of classical antiquity. But this is a mentorship, right? This is, if you entered the office of H.H. H. Richardson, you entered the monastic cult of architecture. It's completely life consuming. It's not a profession. We go into Richardson's library in Brookline, Massachusetts, circa 1885. And we see, for example, right here, an image of the Hagia Sophia with which I started your, your lecture with. So Byzantium was already radical in the United States thanks to the Victorian period. Remember the 1893 Chicago World's Fair that was the wide city, all classical, classical, classical that put American education into that, uh, into that track of the City Beautiful movement of designing Washington DC, the Lincoln Memorial, like all that stuff. Hidden within the Chicago World's Fair was this Byzantine chapel designed by the studios of Tiffany. Uh, so immersed within the white city of Chicago, we did have this radical revolution. Um, let me fast forward. And finally, the artistic avant-garde. So the disrespect for Byzantine art by the classicist had nurtured, um, um, was precisely what made Byzantine aesthetics appealing to avant-garde iconoclasts. Although rehabilitated by, by Ruskin and Norton and Richardson, Byzantine art was considered by many intellectuals to be reactionary and degenerate. In other words, artists hated Byzantium as much as classical archeologists did. From a formalist point of view, however, Byzantine art offered ammunition with which to discredit the tradition of Western art, the disease launched by the Italian Renaissance. America discovered Byzantium through art and most specifically by the endorsement of British intellectual Roger Fry and member of the Bloomsbury Group. Fry's influential aesthetic theory singled out Byzantium as the only historical precedent for the post-impressionist and avant-garde revolutions of Matisse that you see here, Cezanne, Gauguin, and Van Gogh. Accordingly, impressionism marked the end of realistic representation. Fry equated impressionism with Roman art and post-impressionism with Byzantine art. Quote, the greatest revolution in art had taken place since Greco-Roman Impressionism became converted into Byzantine formalism, end of quote. Byzantium's attraction among the Bloomsbury group in England can be seen in the paintings of Vanessa Bell. Oh, here's Roger Fry, by the way, who, uh, whom I just quoted. Um, and I've been showing you an image, just a portrait of, um, of Madame Matisse by Henri Matisse. And you can see the, the Byzantine kind of abstractions of, of that movement. And here I just show you Vanessa Bell, um, uh, her own, uh, uh, experimentation in art um, in a Byzantine uh, painting of a, of a self-portrait as a Byzantine lady. And then finally, Roger Fry and, and Duncan Grant making mosaics themselves in 1904. And finally, Roger Fry, and uh, I won't get into the detail, Virginia Woolf is the most important member of that circle, coming to Greece in 1932. And this is where Virginia Woolf has a complete breakdown about what is the role of classical culture? What is the role of ancient Greek in relationship to modernity? and modern Greece. So it's important to know that um, Roger Fry then becomes the first director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And he's hired by JP Morgan to go around Europe and build a Byzantine collection. If you go to the Met today, you'll find a beautiful Byzantine gallery. It's all because JP Morgan became attracted to this radical um, uh, 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 curator, Roger Fry, who is also you know, a philosopher and all these kind of things to create a new Byzantine collection. So if you're in Corinth in the 1920s, right, and you're excavating Byzantine houses and you come up with a statue that looks like this under the West, the West shops as published by Bronier in 1935, and you have the Matisse, uh, Matisse sculpture on the side, you realize that it's, it's a no brainer that this is the predecessor of that. So Byzantium is the first traditional uh, architecture of the traditional style for the breaking of classical form. All right, let me see. So how much time do I have? Uh, let, me, let, me, let me take a moment and see if there's any kind of questions or uh, how, how much time do I have to get, to get a little bit more into the, um, into the Corinth material? Should I take questions now just for, for kind of the historical setting? Because I know much of it has been very, you know, historically dense. Mm -hmm. um, any questions yeah. about the periods or the the the, the points of the reference? You know, Raskin, 
Venice, Corinth. I, I'm kind of curious in, in regards to this uh, <clears throat> uncovering of Byzantium and the discovery of the wide, varied styles of art and architecture that was being appreciated by architects at the time yeah. and how, how that seems to be influencing kind of like the sense of liberty that art architects took and artists took into just pushing the boundaries. Exactly. And um, I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts are uh, where we are today yeah. in regards to that and how architecture over the last hundred years since that point has yeah. um, gone through many different movements and like kind of the architecture that is vernacular um, for lack of a, a good term, uh, development architecture, builder architecture uh, is fairly <clears throat> bland and uniform and, and doesn't have a lot of character and it's kind of like implied, uh, ideal, domestic, et cetera. I'm just kind of curious how, what your thought is on how we might yeah. go through a, a similar transformation again. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a great question. The reason why I'd like to focus on this generation of architects in the 1920s and all the way pushing forward Louis Kahn, you know, his 1951 visit to Corinth is because I think maybe Kahn, perhaps all the way up to Kahn, is the last generation where, where one could imagine a kind of revolution or a kind of uh, liberty that is grounded in a, in a historical experiment. Because I think what, what happens with the, with the migration of the Bauhaus into American academia, there's notions like, let's, let's break all, all links uh, to history. So it's all tabula rasa and it's all like creativity, it's all, you know, which is all wonderful and liberating, but it means we cannot understand those, we can't understand those people in the 1920s and 30s. With post postmodernism, we discovers it. And I think I mentioned to you, like Robert Venturi is Richard Stilwell's student. Robert Venturi is connected to that, um, to that art historical, architectural historical tradition. Um, but then it becomes part of, as postmodernism, it becomes a linguistic game and it loses that dimension of, um, uh, of experiential dimension and, and history, Byzantium as a way in which you get in touch with all your senses and you become more corporeal in some way and you are still grounded with all those examples of history. Uh, you don't break that link, you just find different sorts of inspiration. And I think the, the uh, you know, the, the, the post-impressionist artists are doing it, right? They are they're still maintaining somehow um, uh, kind of a link to the human body, although it's, it, it completely disappears in the, with abstract expressionism in the, you know, in the 50s and 60s. Um, so the question that we have now, I think, is should we even study art history? Like, does this, does this even matter? Like, does it matter for you to know what's the difference between classical and Byzantine? Um, and my answer would be is that Obviously, the you know uh, the, you, you don't there is you don't have much motivations in contemporary culture to become to spend like a year of your life in Rome or a year of your life in Greece where you just look at old stuff, right? However, I think that the the level of conversation about what is the role of the past and the present is so um, um, impoverished right now that you have no option then I think to find perhaps your own entry point into a richly layered stratigraphically complicated site that cannot be reduced to categories of historicist or formalist, uh, you know, postmodern versus deconstructivist, um, um, Black Lives Matter against Black Lives, you know, like, uh, you know, you can't be reduced to binaries of I choose A or B, but it involves kind of complexities of, 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 um, uh, of scale, of experience, of, and you can only do that by putting yourself in the dirt. I think maybe I think that's the discovery. Um, and I think with many of the, many of the architects of the 1920s, is it was a form of liberation. It was like they, they literally, with a license that Isadora Duncan and the artists are giving them, with the lenses of the dirtiness and the, and the, and the muddled, and, but, but the colorfulness of, of Byzantine, you know, Greek material culture, uh, they could really redirect the attention to the senses in a way that it had been robbed because of those uh, education of neoclassicism where it was all about vision. So dance, movement, uh, uh, you, know, you know, color or something more syn you know, um, um, synergetic. Um, I have not really answered your question. Yeah, it's, it's the, the, 
the the thing that I like about this generation of the 20s is they never formed the school. Like they're, they obviously lost, right? They did not win. They never made it into the history books, right? Because they were either uh, discarded as historicists and therefore stuck to the old world and, uh, and forgotten, right? Um, so I think for me, partly like discovering these lineages, right? Between um, Lester Holland, who, who created the HABS program. It's like, how, how more boring can you get? A bunch of architects in the 1930s going to, to draw like houses that Washington slept in, right? Being the instigator of uh, the, the, the person that taught Louis Kahn how to draw, who's actually back in Corinth in, in like a couple of years before Kahn is there. And he's obviously the one that's telling him what to do when he's there, right? That kind of more diachronic kind of connection between that. So as a historian, my job, I think is more to like find those threads but I have really very little to advise you in what to do with those threads. Um, can I can I say something? Please, I, yeah. I really love this talk. You know, I mean, I remember when I was studying, when I first graduated, I went to Rome and I, it changed my life, you know, from Seattle. I, I, I was living in Rome and uh, it was an, uh, it was an incredible experience, which I'm sure has shaped my my thinking. But I remember when I first was reading Le Corbusier and he was discovering the polychrome of ancient Greece. And then he made these polychrome abstract sculpt sculptures, which, you know, I mean, he wasn't a great sculptor, but they're really interesting to look at now in thinking that he was, the way he came at it was discovering something in ancient Greece and made these really weird modern abstract sculptures in all these colors. And uh, yeah, I think, I think what you said is how, you know, history is, the study of history is so important in, in, in a cultural way and, and it is very impoverished now. And I, th I think, I really believe that our Columbia University has, is in need of a new dean because the current dean who's now leaving, you know, thinks that all of architecture history began with OMA right? <laughs> the Office of Metropolitan Architecture. I mean, come on. I mean, it's not, that's not, that's not the truth. And it's very shallow, actually, that kind of thinking. So I really like this talk. Perhaps I would, um, you know, I would, uh, I would turn it to you guys in terms of even, you know, I don't know if somebody can articulate for yourself, like, what is, or like, you know, forget about Greece, you're not going to Greece for the next, you know, couple of months. Uh, but you're in the Hudson Valley, and you do have Montgomery Place, and you have Alana, right? So how do you position yourself between those two historical artifacts that you don't understand because they're not part of your civilization, but they're what makes the Hudson Valley the Hudson Valley, right? It's not, I mean, of course, it's the landscape, right? But is there an element of, the, of, of a historical experiment? I mean, when you go and, and tour Atlanta and you see all the costumes that Edwin Church, you know, they dressed up in, um, you know, in, um, in Orientalist costumes to have dinner. Right. There is, it, how is that different from Montgomery Place where you dressed up in your gowns, right, to go? I mean, I, I, I would challenge you to think about the presence of history even in, the, in these nuggets. And I think they do present two, I, I, once again, I don't want to reduce things to a kind of, you know, binary, like I'm pro, um, you know, Alana versus pro Montgomery Place. But I think that they, if you see them as the closest thing to you to a kind of philosophy of existing in a, in, in a landscape, then and, if, and do kind of a personal response to it and kind of liberate yourself to them as opposed to feeling like, well, I can't even begin to think about it because I have not taken a class on, you know, on Hudson Valley School of Painting or I don't know anything about it, you know, like, like forget about that stuff and, and, and see if you can use the, the old and the boring to liberate your modern self. Yeah, I think one, one avenue of approaching this question of, of uh, sort of comparing and understanding uh, the Valley of Alana, for example, is to understand um, the, the sort of historicity of the site as, as more of a sensitivity or a sensib sensibility to yeah. uh, its own existence. So for example, I think about, um, I think you said something like, there's a conflict between the classical, which has a sort of very mathematical and perfection, uh, sort of an ideal of a perfectionism, a perfection across time. And of course, mathematics is, very, is, is actually timeless, you know, like a truth from 200 years ago, so long as it's not proven to be false, it's still true today, it's still yeah. true tomorrow. And so it doesn't have this sort of, a pure classical uh, thinking doesn't have this sort of sensitivity to its own time. 
And I loved what you said about the Byzantine having dealing with its time and dealing with its past because uh, in this way, it sort of anticipates its own uh, passing, its own death, its own end of use. Yeah, yeah. And, and so when I think about Olana, I really think about, um, aside from obviously the, the, the excitement of its, of its history and wanting to learn about its history, Mm -hmm. I really think about its sensitivity to its itself and um, its situation as a moment in time and not trying to claim that it will be uh, forever. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I would, I mean, it's, it's also, I think the, just, I think the lessons that we have from these architectural fellows is there's nothing you can like, there's nothing you can say about Alana right now, unless you go and spend six hours in like looking at it, right? This is that like, there's no way to make an, an assessment with, uh, because it's, I mean, this is I think one of the, one of the, one of the biggest threats. Like if you, it's very easy to say, well, you know, Alana is, it's very easy to sort of turn Alana into an icon of a certain period of history that we, we want to reject because it, it didn't take the Islamic world seriously, right? Or, or same thing with Montgomery Place. It's a bunch of, you know, you know rich white people who, you know, uh, took over the Native American sites that, you know, uh, you know Bard College is very careful about, about highlighting and, 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 and what have you. Um, yeah. I, it's I like also, thinking. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, I, okay. I was just going to add um, that something came to me while you were speaking. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot like uh, the comparison between like a John Ruskin documentation of a site or it's a, it's a watercolor. There's mm -hmm. very little actual measure. And nice. then a, uh, point. Yeah. you know, a really measured and documented uh, sort of statement about how classical architecture was created. I think the, there's a feeling that I have that if you were to sit next to John Ruskin and ask him to measure out everything that he sees, he would say, well, there's something missing. There's something that you're not capturing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so I think, I think what I'm, I'm getting out of this lecture, and I really, really love this, uh, this presentation. Yeah. Um, is just that, you know, if, if an object uh, doesn't anticipate its own death or its own use, or it's, it's really, it's, a, it's placement, it's, it's uh, existential sensitivity, um, mm -hmm. then it's, it's hard for it to have a real like life or, uh, so if without, without the sort of end or an anticipation of itself, uh, it can't really live. Yeah. 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 And I think another lesson that I would get, I can get into this a little bit. I think one of the, one of the greatest lessons that Ruskin could give us is something that actually happened after. I mean, sort of, he, he was the intellectual force, but something called the Anti-Scrape Society, which is one of my favorite things. The Anti-Scrape Society was an organization in England, which is a historic preservation um, philosophy that was against, um, against the, uh, you know, returning monuments back to their original state of, of one period of one perfection. And the idea is that the passage of history puts, like, if, like a building is like a book and every generation that uses it adds a page. So you can't go ripping off pages from a book because you get the, you, you know, you miss the, you miss the story. Um, so in some way, I think I, I take that lesson from Ruskin is that when I try, you know, when I try to understand a place, I try to understand all the different time periods of, of boom and bust of, of, of modern and, and, you know, as, as I can experience it, as I can feel it as a, as, as a kind of an attitude towards a place that is not puristic, but it's more uh, saturated. Right. So, um, once again, Ruskin, so dépassé, like you can't, like there's probably no person that could be more canceled than Ruskin right now. He's horrible. I mean, he's just an absolutely horrible, like there's so many, you know, he's, he's racist. He is, uh, you know, he hates women. He, uh, you know, it's, so there's no reason to read Ruskin in the 21st century. But I think the, that sensibility of that, of his, that you were, that, that you, that you captured, that um, very different kind of looking at a monument for, Find, finding clues of its own death within it. Um, yeah. If, if, do you guys, can I show you a couple more things? Do you have time to, or should we? Do, okay. I it? think we should be wrapping up soon. I'm, yeah. I'm intrigued. I would love to see yeah. a couple more, uh, maybe five minute constants. Do you think this okay, is manageable? Good. Yeah. The okay. one thing I'm going to, I'll do it very quickly. I'm going to show you, I'm going to take the first three minutes. I'll rush through this because I haven't talked about the humanitarian challenge, right? That thing, I, what, I, what I haven't shown you is that, you know, when those architects came to, I mean, they didn't just go to Greece because Greece was like a great place to have a cappuccino. That was Rome. That was Rome. The person that went to Greece risked death, right? The person that went to Greece 
risked the probably a very much more impoverished place, a place that was dealing with 1.2 million refugees, a place that had the, the most severe ethnic cleansing that could ever have occurred in any European country uh, through the Balkan Wars. Uh, it was a place that was ravaged. I mean, let's not even go to World War II. I mean, World War II was, you know, equally, uh, it, like when, we cannot forget that when Louis Kahn gets to Delphi in 1951, right, he goes to a country that was, like that part of the world was run by guerrillas, like for like five years before he arrived. And the people who, and, and, and the army that suppressed those guerrillas that had the power base in the mountains of Fokis, were the groups that American uh, that, that, that Americans were bombing, right? So there's a sense of like, well, it's not just Greece. It's like the Greece of 1951, which is the beginning of the Cold War, which is the American, I mean, America, you know, flying airplanes with agent or testing Agent Orange in the forests of, of Greece um, before they perfected to use it in Vietnam, right? It's, it, it's a complicated sort of geopolitical game. Um, so let's talk about what it means to be an architect and find yourself in a um, in an environment who is uh, who who has a lot more needs, perhaps, right, than um, uh, than your architectural education, your 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 architectural refinement. So I very want to. And I would also point your attention to the question to the Q and A. Oh yeah. Some well, questions coming. So when whenever you have a chance, you gauge absolutely, it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Let me let me do let me take that out. When you pointed out how timber roofed members are were used as firewood by the Greeks, a harsh reality seen in contemporary Gaza, Ethiopia, building elements lost of immediate needs. What do you think the role of, the, of an architect designer is, is learning from objects that might not find a role beyond their use in extreme environments we face today with climate change and political issues? What an amazing question. I think part of it is understanding the building as a body. The one thing that we learned from our project in Lidoriki, where we um, studied the, the remains, is that when someone says the Germans came in and burned the village, what does that actually mean architecturally? The stones don't burn. What burned is the timber that was actually supporting the, the floors and then the roof, right? So when the when the, the villagers returned to rebuild the village, they lived in the ruins. So they selected to save some buildings and like they lived in some sheds and they, so what they did was actually to kind of read so it really is that the, there's, there's a kind of biological dimension to the different parts of the building, whether it is the casement windows that require wood, whether it's stone, whether it's mortar. Like I think there's another sensitivity that's really important to think of the building as, as a, uh, a synthesis of multiple crafts or of multiple organic material or inorganic material that obviously when time of need comes or time of crisis, some are more vulnerable than others. But that's what makes them so beautiful, right? The, vul the vulnerability of wood versus, versus stone is its very strength. It's the fact that you can go to the forest next door and chop up a piece of timber and create, uh, you know, and use it for a roof um, as opposed to quarrying a piece of stone or, or creating mortar. So I, 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 it's, it's, it's the, the Byzantine perspective, right? Which, which, turned its attention away from the perfect masonry classical building that's made all out of marble and, and then bronze ties that keep the marble, meant that the, one had to deal with the messy, cheaper products that were building material at times of need, like the Greek Middle Ages, like the you know, like, like periods of, of, uh, um, uh, of, of great displacement. Uh, so in some ways, kind of working with the, working with a variety of with a hierarchy of crafts that that are that, that, that are all brought together in the building. So it's, and unfortunately it's different in every place, right? Because it, it's so environmentally, uh, um, this is something that we saw by the way, also in, in this analysis of refugee camps today, we've seen, I mean, one of the things that have been documented is how Syrian refugees today actually go to houses, you know, what's, the, what is the, 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 the relationship between a contemporary refugee and the raw materials in the neighborhood that causes some of the tension when, you know, when you need firewood and there's a building, a abandoned building across the street, right? And, and how, what, are the, um, what are the processes? How do you steal that piece of wood? Do you put it in a bucket? Do you cut it, right? Do you, like, how, how does that actually work, work itself out? It means it requires understanding how the initial builder made that wood arrive there to begin with and what kind of invasive process they participated in or what kind of endorsed destruction they were, uh, they were part of, like basically chopping down a forest. Um, so I think that the corporeality of the medieval material culture that was discovered 
was also a much more environmentally sensitive uh, uh, perspective. Okay, uh, are you guys five minutes? Are you sure? Okay, because I think this might actually answer some of the questions of, of the. Go ahead, Gustis. Yes, thank okay, you. Okay, I'll do it. I'll do it very quickly. Uh, okay, so I'll skip through some of these. Uh, Okay, humanitarian architecture, very, I'm gonna show you the work of Pete de Jong, one of these architects who basically, here's, here's his drawings. He did these caricatures of everyone, all the, all the arch, other architecture fellows. Anyway, he comes to Greece and he works for the East Macedonian Reconstruction Service that among other things is involved in rebuilding uh, Thessaloniki that burned in 1917. And among them is uh, someone named um, uh, Mawson, who's a British landscape architect, and someone named Zachos, who's a Greek architect. So they're going around essentially and rebuilding these destroyed towns. And here's this archaeologist designing a little village in Macedonia. And here's the here, here's the the one of the surviving um, um, uh, um, buildings. Uh, the same archaeologists are also connected with other humanitarian groups. For example. In Greece, there's an organization, was an organization called Near East Relief that was founded during the uh, Armenian genocide in the 19 teens in Turkey. And as, you know, uh, Greek populations were, were, were exchanged, were, were um, um, a long complicated story, were pushed out of Turkey, so did the Armenian orphans that had been victims of, of, of massacre, you know, 10 years earlier. So Near East Relief moves its headquarters to Greece. One of the first places that they do, one of the first um, uh, orphanages that's built is in Corinth, right? So around the corner from the archeologists and the architects, you have these American, Protestant, mostly humanitarians that are managing 2000 orphans that they've marched from Turkey that have marched already from Armenia that are being taught they're being educated, being taken care of by this, like haphazard, you see this, the architecture here is very, uh, here's a picture of those orphanages taken into the Roman baths in Old Corinth. Like this is that, uh, th this, this is the, um, the spring that I pointed out. And here on the left, what, the, what I will show you is this uh, Byzantine museum. Uh, very much in, in, invested, like the architects are also kind of sidelining beyond doing the archaeology in helping out uh, the, the quick construction of these emergency relief places. Um, we forget that Athens um, uh, was a place with a lot of refugees. Here's the a view of what became the Athenian Agora excavations. Um, and you see that these are all shacks and, um, and, and temporary buildings. Um, the excavations in Olynthus went a step further in that they hired refugees for their excavation. Here they are drawing the trenches. They hired 200 refugee workmen. And not only that, they helped build the refugee settlement that you see here, these, these modular houses, very cheaply made, and in fact lived in them, right? They actually used them as their own residences. Now, now you, you have to agree that the commitment, an architect, archaeologist's commitment to humanitarian relief is to go to Greece, not to enjoy the sun and the beach and the sand and the Greek temples, but to spend three months working at a refugee camp is, is a completely different um, proposition. Um, so they are also assist in creating these model towns. I'll show you the one um, I showed earlier, these, these very interesting uh, um, cheaply made modular houses that, that are actually very interesting typologically. And they also disappear from the history of Greek architecture because by 1929, when this organization, when this relief effort is over, uh, modernism arise from the Bauhaus and the, uh, the uh, you know, Siedlung type of refugee housing, which is a you know, concrete Corbusian building becomes the norm. And these intermediary buildings, they're not tents, like I showed you earlier, and they're not like Siedlungs, German Siedlungs, but this in between locally made um, um, uh, intermediaries that are all different, depending on which part of, of Greece they're, they're part of. Second part, the same, the, some of the archeologists that are excavating you know, material culture from houses are also very much interested in understanding the domestic culture of contemporary Greece. So Priscilla Capps, who's the daughter of the director of the American school, uh, sets up a, uh, um, a um, it goes around Greece and collects uh, craft uh, textiles. And in the spirit of Isadora Duncan and Raymond Duncan and Penelope Sikelianos, they use, they, they, they hire all the refugees 
to, who, who, by the way, they're coming from Turkey and they have intense like textile skills and they're hiring them to, um, uh, to create these uh, dolls, for example, that they sell as fundraisers. And I'll show you very quickly a um, little exhibition at Franklin Marshall where we took some of the, these are um, uh, artifacts that are made in Lesbos by a contemporary refugee relief uh, who takes the, um, you can see they're like little pouches. Uh, they take the, the, you know, the, the plastic rafts that are disposed on, the on, the, on Lesbos and the, the refugees today are making these little beautiful little wallets, which are then sold so they can make, uh, so they can, uh, make money for refugees who are not able to, um, to work next to one of these dolls that was made by refugees in Greece 100 years earlier. Um, anyway, finally, this is really sort of the icing of the cake. So the museum, and, and this is I think probably the most relevant one for your project. So the museum of Byzantine antiquities that is designed in the 30s, here's 1930, excavated and kind of built in, survives today as a folly, right? Because it never actually opened. Here's what it looks like. And you can see it has that very, that sense of a new building that talks about the death of the building that it's replicating, but it's also a museum that incorporates the original Byzantine stone elements that would have been tossed away a generation earlier because they're not mathematically perfect enough, they're not classical enough, right? That are being incorporated as, as spolia in, in, in the building. And here's the, referring back to John Ruskin's drawing of one of these houses in Venice that, uh, you know, that valorizes that kind of hodgepodge, that, that kind of collage of elements. Uh, and then finally, let me just move forward to, um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll skip all this. Uh, finally, 1936, the, uh, one of the architectural fellows named W. Stuart Thompson, designs a permanent museum that you know is not subject to the war like it's it survives and it's a museum that you'll visit today um, and it was featured in the 1936 issue of architectural record um, and it's a very interesting um, cloistered kind of space um, you see that it's kind of it's designed at the lower part of the um, of the site I showed you where it sits uh, earlier on the site plan uh, you see the general view here once again from architectural record uh, it's very simple, very bare, very Spartan, if you if, uh, forgive the pun, um, Acrocorinth, uh, the site. So it's a museum of archaeology that's in the archaeological site that bears itself in the landscape, stands, you know, somewhat tries to replicate a kind of cloister environment. Um, and then here's my favorite photo that, uh, you know, you see you have these views uh, of the site and the, um, um, and the architectural elements, very modern. Um, made out of concrete. And here's the, uh, the, the museum opening where you see the architects and the archeologists kind of you know, coming together to, to celebrate that, that fusion. So. Um, That's beautiful. Yeah. I, I haven't visited the Corinth Museum myself. Uh, maybe yeah, I, yeah. I, I will do that now and report back to you. <laughs> yeah, you have to go. Where's my yeah, findings yeah. were? <laughs> Fantastic, because yeah. this, this, this is incredible. I mean, I, I, I very, very much appreciate all the connections and the depth of the presentation. This is fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, for letting me take so, so much time to, um, you know, to, you know, to subscribe some of this, some of those points. Yeah, and, it, it, it's, and I will end for, you know, taking advantage of your time with one final quote from 1939, which is when uh, Henry Miller, uh, comes to Greece uh, and he, he writes a very important book called The Colossus of Marusi that sort of describes from a literary point of view what it's like to be a, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, an artist in Greece in the period. So on Christmas Eve 1939, he visits ancient Corinth and, 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 and imagines the site as an oriental mistress. Okay, let's, let's move beyond that. <laughs> but he says, there's something rich, sens sensuous and rosy about Corinth. It is death in full bloom death in the midst of voluptuous, seething corruption. Everywhere this lush, overgrown, overripe quality manifests itself, heightened by a rose-colored light flush from the setting sun. We wander down to the spring, remember the refugees a little bit earlier? Set deep in the earth like a hidden temple, a mysterious place suggesting affinities with the east. So here we are, this is what he saw before the uh, you know, the final, um, uh, you know, the, the, the ultimate destruction of the, of, of the temple. And in some way, I think it gives us a, a, a great final insight in the 
original question that we raised, which is why do Louis Kahn's drawings of the Temple of Apollo mm -hmm. look so unclassical and so interesting? Right, remember the, night, the visit from 1951 where he came to Corinth, a place that's not neutral, but a place that was the premier experimentation site for artists and architects. Um, so anyway, I'll leave you with those initial images. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for your time. And I'm free for questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Any questions, please email me um, or you know, read more about it. If you had, I, I think you've got, I gave you a distillation of all those articles, so do not go read them. <laughs> Don't waste your time going read. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Christine. Good luck with your projects. And I, um, yeah, think of positioning yourself in the, in the experienced muddy, complicated past that cannot be reduced to a, um, an art history exam. <laughs> <laughs> a Great. complex mission Thank ahead. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Christies. Bye, everyone. Good luck. Thank you.